transfigure our doubts and fears into faith and trust in you. Amen. Amen. My text for this morning is our gospel hymn, Higher Ground. Now, of course, I'm going to talk about the scriptures. But when I was looking at hymns for today, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm doing a service later at um, the Episcopal uh, Seniors Home up in Waterford, Canterbury. So I was trying to find a hymn, and I found Higher Ground, and I thought this would be perfect for here. Oh, and Canterbury, too. So this wonderful hymn that I don't know how often you sing it, and I can't say I've sung it more than once or twice, <clears throat> it was written by a middle class white back from New Jersey. <laughs> okay, maybe you don't think that's as funny as I do, but <laughs> it's okay to laugh. Because what did he have to complain about? Right? He was an insurance. He was an insurance salesman. Okay. <clears throat> All right, that's my irony for the day. But uh, this, this uh, text was written in uh, 1892. And this man, um, whose name was Johnson Oatman Jr., loved writing hymns for the Lord and apparently wrote over 5,000 hymn texts in his lifetime. That's in the average of 200 a year. I'm, I'm doing well if I can write something poetic like once. Maybe. So apparently this is one of his early ones and one of his favorite ones, although some of his other hymns have gotten more popular. But this was immediately a hit, and the tune was written by someone that he would collaborate with periodically. And uh, the tune writer got $5, and Mr. Owen only took $1 for each of his hymns, because he didn't think he should be making money off praising God. Wow. All right, so as I was looking at this hymn, I thought this, this hymn really fits today and what I want to tell you. So I'm going to refer to the hymn. If you want to open up, leave this to 165 and read along, you can. <clears throat> We're not going to sing it over again. Well, maybe not till the end, but verse 1. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. There's this idea that the higher you get, the better God hears your prayers. Not exactly sure where that came from, and it, only, it doesn't only apply to Christians. Um, I've been blessed to travel to some interesting places in my life. And when I was on the uh, Acropolis in Greece, where the Parthenon is, I met a guy named Steve, and Steve was on a sabbatical from his job in Southern California, and he was visiting spiritual high places. He was looking for spiritual highs, and he was, <clears throat> perhaps not surprisingly, going to a bunch of high places, literally. So we were up there on the Acropolis of Athens, and his next hope was to get to Mount Kenya. And if his money didn't run out, he was hoping to get to Mount Fuji. And, and if you go to some places in the world, they will tell you, you can find spiritual power places. I'm going to be going to Sedona, Arizona, with my daughter on spring break pretty soon. And you can get in a pink Jeep and go to a, a spiritual high place. They call them power vortexes. I've yet to feel one. Maybe I'll go this time. But, of course, they're on the top of the mountain. So the idea of, Lord, I want to be closer to you, let me get up higher, is, you know, it, it runs through different cultures. You know, where do people put temples in the old, old days? They put them on mountains, right? So if you're getting closer to God and imagine to be up, then let's get up. So <clears throat> ever since the 4th century AD, the church has put transfiguration uh, the story of uh, Peter, James, John, and Jesus going up the mountain as the last great story before we dive into Lent. And maybe that is because that spiritual high gives us a little bit of hope before we go back down into the depths of Lent and repentance and feeling like, man, I don't know if I deserve Easter yet. So Jesus takes his friends. And they go from 
Caesarea Philippi, which is where, I don't know, my voice is doing something weird, where Peter was the one that said, uh, when Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. And in Matthew, Jesus says, I'm going to call you the rock, not to be confused with Dwayne Johnson. I'm going to call you Cephas or Petros. And on that rock, I'm going to build my church, only in Matthew. And Peter is so excited about this. And then when Jesus says, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified and raised again. And Peter's going to say, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. We're going to get you out of here. What does Peter get called for his trouble? What did they call him? What did Jesus turn around and say, get behind me? Say, talk about a smackdown. Poor Peter. He just got praised as being the smartest one in the class, right? You got it! And now it's like, get behind me, Satan. So maybe, maybe it was for the sake of Peter, who just got that <clears throat> pretty harsh talking to, that Jesus takes him along. Oh, might as well take James and John too. They seem to go everywhere together. And go up the mountain for this experience. Now, perhaps... The song, although it says higher ground, we, we know that you don't have to climb a mountain to get close to God. We know that you can have a spiritual high from any place on earth. We know that God doesn't require physical height. Uh, so maybe this song is about how much, when we are feeling low, we really need higher ground. Mm -hmm. Like Peter, I don't know. Sometimes we feel like, I just wish I had a spiritual moment. And like Peter, we long to get up some higher ground. And when Peter gets his great experience of that cloud and the voice, his first in inclination is, this is cool. Let's build some dwellings here. Moses, Elijah, Jesus. This will be hospitable. We can all chill up here. This is good. I like this. This is much better than being down there and being called names by Jesus. But no, Jesus says, we can't, we can't stay here. We have to go back down. And don't talk about it. I wonder how long that lasted. Verse 2. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where those abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Well, there's Peter and the disciples right there. I don't want to go back down that mountain. I don't want to go back down where the fears and the doubts arise. In our first reading, we had uh, kind of the... Uh, the precursor story, we have Moses on the mountaintop, right? Moses gets the amazing experience of God. Moses gets flames and holy smokes, literally. And I think about, I think about the guys left below. Aaron and her. Moses says, just take care of whatever they need. We're, we're going to be gone for a while. So I, I think as a pastor of Aaron and her, like, are you kidding me? You're leaving me with all these people? And then we have the Israelites themselves, who, as you know, get a little bored, get a little fearful, get a little dismayed, and they build what? Move. Yeah. Let's roll down the jewelry and make ourselves something we can see. We don't know where Moses went, so let's build something we can see. It'll be pretty. We can touch it. Oh, boy. On the bottom of the mountain, Hoping for higher ground. Well, it's not only people in the Bible that feel that, is it? I feel like I'm there an awful lot of the time. Because when I look around the bottom of the mountain, spiritually, not just physically, yeah, what was that that the verse said? Doubts arise and fears dismay. Yeah, yeah I feel that. Looking around our country, looking around our state of Michigan, we still can't fix the dang roads among the few other problems. Looking around our city, our neighborhoods, despite the promises of 
economic success right around the corner. Doubts arise and fears dismay in my heart. How about yours? Even when beloved religious leaders preach about the glossy future, sometimes my doubts arise and fears dismay. I admit this even as a priest who is supposed to like be immune, right? We're not immune. And there are weeks when all I see around is the struggle of being on the low ground. When all I notice are the injustices that are in our so-called justice system. By the inequities that are so built into our economic system. When sometimes lifting every voice to sing might make heaven ring, but the earth is still crying. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. The song of saints on higher ground. Sometimes we get the glimpse. Sometimes we get the high. I'm not sure any Christian would come to church more than once if there weren't some higher ground involved. If we didn't have some kind of experience in our lives that made us realize, oh yes, there is more. There is more than the fears and the doubts at the bottom of the mountain. Now one of my spiritual highs was going to live in West Africa, in Liberia. That's why I'm wearing this. This is, uh, this is not pretty, this is not fancy, but this is country cloth which the people of uh, Liberia would make on these, on these crazy looms that stretched. And, and for some reason, they just made little strips. This is one strip of country cloth that's made into a stole. And this is a, uh, this actually is a chief's outfit made into a, uh, into a chasuble for today. But that was my spiritual high, and that was a long time ago. But I felt God so strongly bringing me there and walking beside me, that when I feel like life at the bottom of the mountain is getting to me, sometimes I remember a year and a half on higher ground. So have you had higher ground times? Yeah? Yeah? You've had them? You've had some higher ground moments? Maybe not last week. Maybe not last year even, but sometime when you just knew, yep, the Lord is here. Amen. And his glory might just transfigure this whole messy place that I'm at. Have you had those times? I hope so. And maybe that is why Jesus told Peter, don't talk about him now. Wait till you need this story. Wait till we keep walking down this mountain, because it's going to get messy I already told you about the crucifixion. You didn't want to hear it. But hang on to this story and tell it when you need it. Tell the story when you need it again. That epistle that we had is chalked up to Peter, probably written by his followers. I think pretty much every scholar there is says, this looks way too good to be written by an actual fisherman in about 40 AD. So somebody that knew Peter. But Peter writes in that wonderful epistle about remembering that time, right? We were there. We saw it. We heard it. And he's writing these words to a church that is discouraged about how long they're spending at the bottom of the mountain. It's been a generation, and he hasn't come back yet. You said he was coming back. Where's he? And so Peter is saying, we were there. This is real. Learn from it. Let it be like a light shining in your darkness. Take it from us who were there. Give your testimony. Peter's given his testimony. How often do you share your testimony? Is it something Episcopalians don't do? I don't know. I think we need to hear it more often. 
Because those of us who are thinking, I need higher ground, sometimes need to be reminded by the testimony of people who have had some occasions to say, I knew it was the Lord. And you might not be knowing that right now, but I can tell you, this is when I knew it was the Lord. Don't stay in the dumps. Don't let fears and doubts dismay. Jesus is really here. That mountaintop story happened a long time ago, but we're still, still telling that story. We're still wishing we had one like that. I don't know of anybody that's had one quite like that. Bright clouds, voices, not unless they were taking something funny. I don't recommend it. <laughs> and that is not what we're going to be doing here. <laughs> not the purpose of the incense. <laughs> we're not going to get smoking something funny to make us see visions. But, but we can tell our testimony of when we knew it was the Lord. And we can hold that up to others that need it, need it too. And you don't even have to go hiking to have a transfiguration day. Sometimes actually sliding down the hill is much more effective. Have you found that? When you finally say, this is it, Lord, I'm at the bottom. And he comes to give you a hand up. The last verse, I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I couldn't end Black History Month with y'all without quoting the most famous mountaintop sermon that there ever was. Dr. King in Memphis. And here's a man who'd seen the worst that Satan could throw at a man. Sometimes I wonder if we learned from that. I wasn't yet three in April of 1968, so I do not have personal memories, but many of you will. He preached his mountaintop speech uh, the day before he was assassinated, speaking to the striking garbage workers and their supporters in Memphis. And the end of that speech is eerie and prescient, and I'm just going to read the last couple minutes. <clears throat> I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. And it doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Well, I've no doubt that Dr. King is now dwelling in the glory of the Lord, the full glory of the Lord. And he's chilling with Jesus and Moses and Elijah. None of them had it easy. They all bore the weight of God's calling, and they reached higher ground. I'll continue to pray that the brightness of the kingdom of God is making its way to our side of that mountain. The side where the faithful struggle with their doubts and fears, and they also share the stories of the light that we've seen. The times we knew it was Jesus in the cloud. Like Peter advises, we will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Until together we're standing in higher ground.
Can we sing the refrain? Yeah.